know that my work has always been in the area of the lung and vascular biology. And a lot of people have asked me, what are you doing talking about parenteral nutrition and, and manganese? So I thought I would start out by telling you how I got into this story. So my husband is a neurotoxicologist. He's a PhD researcher. And his area of international fame, really, is heavy metal neurotoxicity. And the two metals that he has studied widely, has 400 publications, is the, the metal mercury and the metal manganese. So we have been married 33 years. And for 33 years, I have read more about manganese than I ever wanted to know. But about 10 years ago, after reading, I can't tell you, hundreds of papers about this metal, I began to wonder what, how much manganese were we giving our babies getting parenteral nutrition? And I did the math, and I did the math again, and I thought I was doing something wrong. I asked him to do the math, and he turned to me and said, what the hell are you guys doing in the nursery? And thus, this study was born. So I'm going to take you through um, a clinical study that we have recently completed in the neonatal intensive care unit at Vanderbilt. And you'll see why I titled this, Is There Poison in the Parental Nutrition? So I'm going to start this off with a, one of my favorite quotes that I use in many of my talks, but it applies to this one. Experience is the ability to make the same mistake repeatedly with increasing confidence. And I think that it applies to many of our practices, including this one. I also have this slide. It says, all the good questions have already been answered. And one of my fellow trainees said this to me um, a few years ago. And I just want to say to all the young people in the audience that all the good questions have not already been answered. And that you can do yourself very relatively inexpensive studies that answer really important questions. And don't believe that all the good questions have already been answered. OK, so I'm going to introduce this topic by saying that modern parenteral nutritional formulations were first developed quite a long time ago, in the 1960s. And there are more than 40,000 patients in the United States alone and worldwide, obviously many more, who are permanently dependent on parental nutrition to survive. And many more, like our neonates, by and large, are sustained for finite periods of time on complex intravenous nutritional formulas. And until about 30 years ago, trace elements were thought to be of little significance to human nutrition. But we now know that many factors can cause a, an individual or a population of uh, individuals to be susceptible to diseases resulting from trace element deficiencies or trace element excess. So here's your periodic table of elements. And there are eight trace elements that are nutritionally essential in humans. And if we were a smaller group, I'd have you name them for me. But for the sake of time, they're here. They are, oops, sorry, iodine, iron, zinc, copper, manganese, chromium, molybdenum, selenium. And quantitatively, these elements represent a small fraction of the total mineral content in the human body. That's why they're called trace elements. But they play a very essential role in many metabolic pathways. So all nutrients have an optimal range of intake, whether uh, with either deficiency or excess being potentially harmful. The trace elements that are of toxic importance only are aluminum, and mercury. They have no beneficial effect in human health. You do not need these elements at all. There are two trace elements that have very limited evidence for human deficiency, unless you have some kind of inborn error of metabolism. One is manganese, and the other is molybdenum. There has never been a naturally occurring example of manganese deficiency in humans. You can induce it experimentally, but it doesn't occur naturally. There are many clinical deficiency states that have been described for six of the elements. Iodine, which we all know, uh, iron deficiency, very common, zinc, copper, chromium, and selenium. We're only going to talk about a few for the sake of time. 
So preterm infants are at an increased risk of developing trace element deficiencies, primarily because they have very low stores at birth. Most of the accretion of these trace elements take place in the last trimester of pregnancy. And because of their rapid postnatal growth, increases the demands for these trace elements. And of course, because of the way we feed them, they have variable intake. So the gold standard for infant nutrition, of course, is human milk. And the trace element content in human milk is really the accepted best practice for intake in the full-term infant. But there really is no gold standard for the premature baby. But I think we can, as scientists, come up with some acceptable objectives. One would obviously be to prevent trace minimal mineral deficiencies. Another would be, as Bill Hay would recommend, accretion of stores equivalent to that in the developing fetus. And the last would be to avoid toxicity from excess intake. So I'm going to spend a minute talking about zinc because it relates directly to the manganese story. So this is the best studied of the trace metals. It's nutritionally essential. You need zinc to maintain cell growth and development. There are over 200 zinc metalloenzymes associated with numerous processes such as carbohydrate and energy metabolism, heme biosynthesis, gene transcription. And the content of zinc in colostrum is quite high, but it decreases postnatally. And in preterm milk, there's really a very variable content from one mother to another. And indeed, frank zinc deficiency has been described and was very common in premature babies in neonatal intensive care in the 60s and 70s, and actually the early 80s, particularly in breastfed uh, infants. So how many of you have ever seen this horrible diaper rash? It's called acrodermatitis enteropathica, and it is the classic clinical presentation for zinc deficiency. So zinc deficiency will give you skin lesions, growth failure, poor wound healing, hair loss, diarrhea, and decreased protein synthesis and depressed immune function. Very nonspecific signs, but this rash is classic. And it was very common in preterm infants receiving TPN in the 1970s because we didn't add trace elements to our TPN back then. And even subclinical zinc deficiency in premature infants has been described in those given human milk. And so for many decades now, starting in with the recommendations of the American Academy of Pediatrics in 1985, 400 micrograms per kilogram per day of zinc is typically added to uh, premature infants receiving TPN. So the recognition of uh, this zinc deficiency led to the formulation and marketing of an essential trace metal cocktail for patients receiving parental nutrition. And this is pretty universal across the world. I've, I've asked about this. Sometimes the formulations differ a little bit, bit, but they're remarkably similar wherever you are in the world. If you have a nursery sophisticated enough to provide parental nutrition, we almost all add trace elements, and typically in a mixture rather than individually. So in the United States, the formulation that is used in all of our nurseries is called multi-trace 4, sometimes multi-trace 5 neonatal. It contains zinc, copper, manganese, and chromium, and sometimes it also contains selenium, although typically in the U.S. the selenium is added separately. I've shown here uh, in this, on this slide the amount of each of these uh, metals that are added per 1 ml and the recommended daily dose. Um, of each of these metals. And this is pretty much what's done in Europe as well as in the United States. So this brings me to the manganese story, and that's what we're going to be talking about for, for the next 25 minutes or so. So manganese is an essential mineral. It's required for normal growth and development, but exposure to high manganese concentrations results in a disease that's called manganism. But manganism looks a lot like Parkinson's disease when it appears in adults. It occurs under unique environmental exposure conditions such as manganese miners, welders are exposed to high concentrations of manganese, and it causes destructive symmetrical lesions in the basal ganglia, particularly in the area known as the globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nucleus. So healthy adults are protected from manganese toxicity by three barriers. The intestinal barrier that adjusts the amount of manganese we absorb in our diet, depending on how much is there. 
A diet high in manganese, you absorb less. A diet that's manganese deficient, you absorb more. Um, things that have high manganese content are things like tea, has, has a lot of manganese in it. We're also protected by our normal liver function. 90% of manganese is excreted in the bile. And then, of course, we have a mature blood brain barrier. So in adults, despite wide fluctuations in oral manganese intake, the level of manganese in our brain and other tissues usually remains fairly constant. But we have known now for quite a long time, a good 20 years, that parental nutrition and liver disease are risk factors for manganese neurotoxicity. And as I said, a manganese-containing trace element supplement is typically added to parental nutrition solutions in adults and children with fixed ratios of zinc, copper, chromium, and manganese. And the amount of this trace element that we add is based totally on how much zinc we want to give our babies because zinc deficiency was very common early on in neonatal intensive care. But when you give these trace metals intravenously, as we do with TPN, you completely bypass the normal intestinal regulatory mechanisms. We also know that if we have babies on TPN for a long time, many of them will develop cholestasis. And cholestatic liver disease is a known risk factor for manganese neurotoxicity. As a matter of fact, children with biliary atresia, even in the absence of TPN, just eating a normal diet, can get manganese toxicity because they aren't able to excrete the manganese in their diet. So the, there are recommendations in the literature that says you should withhold manganese supplements in patients with liver disease on TPN. But typically, in most of our programs, if you withhold the manganese, you're withholding the zinc, and that's not good. So how much manganese are we really giving our babies in our nursery? So this slide is going to walk you through this. So it turns out that human milk has a pretty low manganese content, 3 to 10 micrograms per liter. Cow's milk has tenfold more manganese, 30 to 50. And if you feed a baby a soy formula, there's lots of manganese in, in plant products. It has very high manganese concentrations. But the absorption of these amounts of manganese from the diet depends on how much manganese is in the diet. So humans absorb about 8% of the manganese in a human milk diet, less than 1% in soy formula. This is how much manganese is in parenteral nutrition in the absence of trace element supplements. And you can see without adding any manganese, there's about 7 micrograms per liter. And this is in the literature, and I'll show you my own data. It shows exactly this amount. But if you give it IV, all of it is absorbed. Then, on top of that, we add multi-trace 4 neonatal, or your equivalent um, compound in, in Europe, which has, believe it or not, 2,500 micrograms per liter, but we add only 2 mLs per deciliter. All of that is absorbed. So this is how much manganese absorption, if you take all of this into account, a baby would get if you feed them 150 mLs per kilogram per day. So if they get 150 mLs per kilogram per day of human milk, they'll get 0.06 micrograms per kilogram per day. A little bit more if they're on soy formula, about quite a bit more actually. This is how much they would get if they got TPN without any added trace elements. And this is how much they get with the trace elements. It's really quite astonishing. This was the math I was doing in my kitchen and didn't believe my eyes. This level, about 2 micrograms per kilogram per day, is the level at which, in the literature, there are multiple cases of manganese neurotoxicity in adults. And so our babies are getting more than 100 times the amount of manganese that they would have been absorbing if they were instead being fed a diet of human milk. I, I thought this was alarming. In addition, our babies have an immature, more permeable blood-brain barrier and are obviously at a critical stage of brain development. The neonatal rodent brain has been shown to be more susceptible to the neurotoxic effects of manganese than adult rodent brain. In monkey, monkeys and rats, there's a correlation between manganese brain concentrations and the severity of CNS symptoms. And another study showed high dietary manganese intake 
in neonatal rats causes developmental deficits. They learn less well in a, in a water maze and other tests. In addition, there's this interesting reciprocal relationship between iron status and manganese uptake. And a lot of these studies were done um, in a collaboration I did with my husband. So in plasma, both iron and manganese are bound to aluminum and transferrin. They are carried on the same transport mechanisms, and they're both taken up into cells by transferrin-mediated endocytosis and by the dimetyl transporter, DMT1. So if you have a, a, a high iron concentration, your DMT1 and transferrin levels are low, and manganese transport is decreased. But if iron levels are low, and many of our babies have iron deficiency, DMT1 and transferrin levels are increased, and manganese transport is increased. So you can see I'm building a story that made me more and more scared as I thought about what we are doing in our nursery. So it turns out that manganese is a paramagnetic metal and can be detected by T1-weighted MRI. It shows up as a hyperintense shortened T1 relaxation time in the basal ganglia, and that's what's shown in this paper from the literature in an adult receiving manganese-supplemented parental nutrition who presented with overt signs of manganese toxicity. And you can see this bright signal here in the basal ganglia uh, in this adult. This is a shortened T1 relaxation time. So it turns out that there are many case reports in the literature, mostly in adults, one study in children but not in neonates, showing that manganese intoxication occurs when parental nutrition provides about one and a half to two micrograms per kilogram per day for an average adult. I already told you our babies are getting about eight and a half micrograms per kilogram per day. These adults have shown up with elevated serum manganese levels, symmetrical high-intensity T1-weighted MR signals in the global, globus pallidus. Some patients have had overt psychiatric symptoms and clinical signs of manganese-induced Parkinsonian-like symptoms with, with uh, motor dysfunction. And at particular risk are those patients that also had cholestatic liver disease on long-term parental nutrition. So I said numerous case reports of abnormal T1-weighted MRIs, but few prospective studies in patients at any age. So I wrote a grant to the NIH, and we eventually got it funded. And the overall goals of this project were to identify neonatal populations at increased risk of excessive brain manganese deposition and altered cognitive and motor development based on their dietary manganese intake, their degree of prematurity, their iron status, and their hepatic function. And ultimately, the plan is to develop some evidence-based recommendations for appropriate manganese supplementation and how best to monitor these infants on prolonged parental nutrition. So we hypothesized that there would be a direct association between shorter T1 relaxation time in the globus pallidus and total dietary manganese, total days on parental nutrition, conjugated bilirubin levels, and blood manganese concentrations. These were the methods that we used. Basically, we um, did MRI um, to, on our Philips, and we used a, just a 1.5T scanner, um, and we measured T1 relaxation time. So the T1 relaxation time is this um, inversion time. It, it, the spins are inverted, and Terry will explain this a lot better than me, but it's the time it takes to go back to, to a normal uh, orientation. And we particularly measured this in a region of interest in the globus pallidus. We actually had a template brain and matched each of the subject's brains to the template brain, so we had the same region of, um, of interest in each uh, of the patients that we studied. So the methods for the study included Brang manganese deposition by magnetic resonance T1 relaxometry. We measured manganese in whole blood by high-resolution inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy. I sent those samples to, to, uh, Nor to Finland where they were measured. No, Norway. We had extensive dietary logs with calculations of total enteral and parenteral manganese from birth until the date of the MRI. And we used multivariable linear regression to estimate the association between dietary manganese, their T1 relaxation time, controlling for gestational age and postmenstrual age at the time of the MRI. So who did we study? 
So we just decided to study the babies at highest risk. So to be eligible for this study, my babies had to be greater than 30 days of age and in the preceding month of life have received more than 75% of their nutrition as parental nutrition. And they had to be stable for transport to the MRI facility because my IRB is crazy. Um, the control group were babies either in my nursery or from the outpatient clinic who were being referred to our MRI facility for a clinically indicated scan, usually seizures or some other problem. They were mostly less than two weeks of age, but we tried to match them for the age uh, of the baby um, at the time of MRI in the parental nutrition group, and they had to have no evidence of liver disease. So we ended up studying 43 infants on prolonged parental nutrition and 30 babies in the control group. The gestational age at birth was quite different between these groups, uh, 27 weeks versus 37 weeks was quite a long range, wide range. So we had babies of every gestational age between 24 and 40 weeks. But at the time that we studied these babies um, with their MRI, their gest corrected gestational age was identical. They were all studied at about term corrected age, and you can see the range here. The total days on parental nutrition prior to MRI was quite different. On average, 50, but we had some babies on, on parental nutrition as long as 120 days. And in the control group, the average exposure was two days, but you can see we had one infant accidentally uh, enrolled as a control. This was a baby who hadn't been on parental nutrition for two months when he was studied, but had received 60 days of parental nutrition early in the course, and it was actually an error but intention to treat study. <laughs> um, and the total dietary manganese, enteral and parenteral, was really quite remarkable. 834 um, micrograms with quite a range. We had one infant who um, had received quite a bit of manganese during their nursery course, and the average was about 100 in the control group, and here is the range. And there's actually a fair amount of manganese in your oral diet, depending on what you're feeding, and that was included in the dietary manganese. So before we um, started looking at MRIs, we really needed, um, and manganese, we really needed to look at the effect of gestational age. And it turns out that there is a strong relationship between gestational age and your relaxation time. Your relaxation time gets shorter the older you are. So this is the entire cohort, our controls as well as our parental nutrition patients. And you can see that there is a relationship. There's quite a bit of variability, as you'll see, and this breaks out by diet. But we all, once we saw this relationship, we knew that all of our results had to be corrected for the baby's gestational age in order to interpret the data. So here's the punchline. I mean, I'm going to show you the graphs, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So here's a control brain and their T1 image. And here is a baby on prolonged parental nutrition um, and their T1 weighted image. And here, I think you can see this bright area in the basal ganglia of one of our NICU patients who had been on parental nutrition with a shortened T1 relaxation time. And it's not subtle. You don't need to be a neuroradiologist to pick this up. And, and my neuroradiologist, who was not part of the study, would start to recognize this and give me calls to say, take a look at this one. So we didn't see this in every baby in the study, but we saw it in quite a few. We also studied seven children who were older, who were on home parental nutrition. Um, generally, these were kids with short gut or some very big functional GI problem and needed to be on parental nutrition at home. This happens to be a four-year-old who had been on parental nutrition almost since birth. And you can see how much brighter the entire brain is. They have a shortened relaxation time on T1 throughout their brain. But I think you can see these punctate, very bright areas in the basal ganglia, ganglia, which is classic for manganese deposition. Other metals do not appear this way on T1 uh, relaxation time. So I, I don't know how well this shows up, um, but this is the association between dietary manganese and T1 relaxation time. And it took us a long time to figure out how to present these data because we had to control for gestational age at birth. So the size of the circle 
is representative of the baby's gestational age. So the older they are, the bigger their circle. The biggest circles are their near, the near-term kids. These tiny little circles are 24 weeks and everything in between. But you can see that after controlling for gestational age, shorter T1R was associated with an increasing total dietary manganese. That relationship was also striking when we just looked at parenteral manganese. So we took out what, what the babies got enterally, and we just looked at their, their parenteral manganese exposure. And again, you can see this relationship between T1 relaxation time and parental manganese after correcting for gestational age. We did a lot of regression modeling thanks to a great biostatistician. This is not my, my gift to science. Um, but I, I want to show you, here are the unadjusted um, regression coefficients, and these are the rege regression coefficients for uh, corrected for gestational age. And you can see that all of these were significantly associated with the MRI findings, but particularly you can see quite a, a strong association with parenteral manganese, um, and also the amount of manganese these babies received in the first 28 days by IV. And the regression coefficient, how large this negative number is, represents the unit decrease in globus pallidus T1 relaxation time for each 100 unit increase in the predictor, which is the manganese, either total manganese, parenteral manganese, or manganese at other times. There was not a strong association with blood um, manganese levels, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. And when we added bilirubin levels and ferritin to the model, we really didn't change the results very much. Um, this is just to show you that we really don't see the same association with, T, with uh, the T2 signal. Um, it was really uh, limited to, to T1 um, MRI, relaxation time. So these are the whole blood manganese levels that we measured in these babies. You can see the median was a 16.1 with normal being 8 to 12, but look at the range. And I had four patients with overtly toxic manganese levels in their blood, levels greater than 30 micrograms per liter. Um, but it turned out, if you looked carefully, so in my nursery, if a baby um, has cholestatic liver disease, if their bilirubin level is greater than two, then we only give trace elements twice a week, not every day, as recommended. So depending on the day that we drew the blood for manganese levels, we had pretty normal levels in the babies who were on a day where there was no trace elements added to their parental nutrition. All of the high levels were um, drawn on days that the trace metals happened to be in the parental nutrition when we drew their blood. And after controlling for gestational age at birth, whole blood manganese was not associated with T1R or total dietary parenteral or enteral manganese, suggesting that the tissue levels and not the blood levels, are a better indicator of how much manganese deposition you have. They're the manganese is cleared from your blood pretty quickly unless your liver is totally failing. We tried to look at the impact of cholestasis, and this is a little confusing, but you can see we had one baby with a direct bilirubin level of 27.9. This was a baby with hemochromatosis, congenital hemochromatosis. This baby was born with a, a bilirubin level over 20. And we found that dietary manganese was associated, of course, as I just showed you with T1R, and so was direct bilirubin. And so what this represents is the curves of T1 relaxation time to total, total dietary manganese. We fixed the gestational age at 30 weeks and the postmenstrual age at 39 weeks, and you can see that as your bilirubin level goes up, your relaxation time goes down as a function of your dietary manganese. So bilirubin um, uh, high conjugated bilirubin levels does impact this relationship. So I'll summarize what I've showed you. Dietary manganese exposure is inversely associated with the T1 relaxation time in the globus pallidus. T1 weighted MRI can be used to screen infants on prolonged parental nutrition for increasing brain manganese deposition. And hepatic cholestasis is a risk factor for increased brain mang um, deposition, manganese deposition in babies on parental nutrition. We also looked at these children 
at, 12, at 6, 12, and 24 months to look at their neural development. And there are problems with this, obviously, a lot of confounders. But we hypothesize that compared with unexposed age-matched controls, infants on prolonged manganese-supplemented parental nutrition would have lower Bailey scores, lower executive functioning scores at 12 months, and slower latencies and attended amplitudes on event-related potential testing. So let me talk to you for a second about ERP. Um, so we did serial measurements, these neuro exams, at 6, 12, and 24 months and ERP at 6 and 12 months, and also before NICU discharge. So this is our ERP um, technology. It's a very simple technology. It consists of this hairnet with 124 leads, 128 leads, that you simply place on the baby's head. You can do it in the NICU. This is a six-month-old in our follow-up clinic having ERP. And the computer gives a sound and the ERP, like an EEG, measures the brain's response to that sound. And it's very standardized, and you do this repetitively, and you get some very nice results. And I, I just compressed this because of the, the sake of time, but after correcting for gestational age, higher dietary manganese was associated with altered neural processing as measured by differences in temporal ERP signals, decreased cognitive, motor, and communication scores at six months, and decreased executive functioning at 12 months. I know there are a lot of confounders. We tried to correct for as many things as we could. There are some limits to what you can interpret from these results with regard to the impact of manganese versus just being on parental nutrition. Um, interestingly, after correcting for gestational age at birth, the ERP changes did correlate also with the globus pallidus MRI T1 relaxation time. But the length on parental nutrition was associated with decreased neurodevelopmental scores at 12 months as well. So I'm going to wrap this up for the sake of time. I have two slides left. This conclusion slide, which says that our current approach to trace element supplementation is not evidence-based. I think we can conclude that pretty firmly. And use of trace element solutions with fixed ratios limits the flexibility that I think we need to regulate manganese and other trace metal intake under various clinical conditions, such as liver disease or iron deficiency. And only individualized supplementation will achieve the appropriate intake. And I speculate that some infants receiving prolonged parental nutrition are at risk for manganese neurotoxicity and associated developmental delays. So I want to finish with this slide that I stole from the literature. This, this particular slide was published in 1975. And I'll tell you why I want to walk you through this. So this is a postulated decline in brain functional capacity with age and exposure to neurotoxic substances. So if you're my age, and you know, out here somewhere, <laughs> we're already in big trouble, right? So here you have all your capacity when you're 25 years old, and it's straight downhill after that. So here's your functional decline under normal circumstances as you get older. And if you think about this as destruction of your dopaminergic neurons leading to Parkinson's disease, because people always ask me, so do your babies have Parkinson's disease? Well, of course they don't. All of us, if we live long enough, will eventually have enough of a decline that we'll develop Parkinsonian-like symptoms. But you have to lose about 80% of your dopaminergic neurons before you present with clinical signs of Parkinsonism. So what if you are exposed to some kind of toxic agent throughout your life and you lose 0.1% more per year? Well, you'll show up with your Parkinson's disease earlier. Or if you lose 0.5% more per year, well, now we're seeing Parkinsonism in our 70s. If it's 1% excess per year, maybe you'll develop your symptoms in your 40s and 50s, like Michael J. Fox. So what if you're a newborn exposed to parental nutrition, and we knock off 30% of your dopaminergic neurons with our excess manganese and our parental nutrition. So that by, when we start out in life, we only have 70% of our neuronal complement. And then we have the normal decline with age. I'm not going to be around to know what happens to my babies 45 years from now. 
But I am concerned that there are many things that we are doing in our nursery that may impact the onset of later diseases in life, the Barker hypothesis, but think about it in the context of brain function. So with that scary note, um, I just want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who worked with me uh, on this study, um, particularly my husband, who's without this idea, this wouldn't have happened, and my colleague, Natalie Maitre um, at Vanderbilt, who's done all of the follow-up studies, and of course, our, our funding. Thank you for your attention. How do you separate out the effects of